what we do here is go back, 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 back. back. I'm sitting here with Mr. James Horton of Sights and Sounds Black History Museum. Uh, Mr. Horton, could you give us a little bit of info on yourself as well as what led you to uh, start the Sights and Sounds Black History Museum? Well, Sights and Sounds Museum was sort of sent my direction by my great-great-grandmother when I was about seven or eight years old. She told me I was going to travel the world telling our story, a story about what her great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother told her about Africa, why we are here in America, and what we ought to be doing and what we ought to be about. I stuttered when I talked, and I said to her, great grandmother, how am I gonna be able to talk and tell the story when I can't, 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 can't even talk myself? She said, the day will come, young man, when they won't be able to shut you up. My son tells me that that day is already here, Dad, do you ever be quiet? I said, well, don't ask me anything about the fast breakers or don't ask me anything about Sights and Sounds Museum. Then I'll, I'll be able to be quiet. But that's how it kind of got started. And then in 1976, during the Bicentennial Year for America, is when I really pull out artifacts and, and assemble Sights and Sounds Museum for the first time. And that's because in working with some young people in Alabama, one of the young ladies said to me, when I'm always talking about black people and what we did and what we accomplished, she said, you need to stop telling us that because we don't ever see anybody in the newspaper who's black who accomplished any of these things that you're talking about. I said, well, but we did. And I start pulling out artifacts and sharing with these young people and shared them with black men and black women. I started getting books that was written by black authors females and males, and sharing it with them, having them to read the book. They do a book report, and then if it's a good book report, then we'll go out and get some ice cream and cookies or something like that. And that's kind of how Sights and Sounds Museum uh, got started. Well, Stephanie, now you mentioned previously that you actually started in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Is there any... Um, uh, special history in Tuscaloosa, Alabama that maybe you could share? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I remember a while back, I believe there was a particular river that you had mentioned uh, that some of the uh, slave catchers weren't able to get across. Um, are you able to share any of those stories? Tuscaloosa, Alabama was, uh, and still is, that's where I was born. I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I only didn't live in Alabama but for two years until I moved here in 2000. So I grew up there, left I moved to Patterson, New Jersey for two years, didn't like it, went back to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I remained there until 2000 when I moved here. It's a very unique place. Uh, growing up there is an experience that I have written about. I shared that experience with my mother before she passed four years ago, and she said, boy, you better not print this book until I'm dead. I suggest that you don't print this until you are dead, you know. And I said, why? She said, uh, there's some things that you say here has got a lot of truth to it, and there's some people probably would be very upset if they knew <laughs> about your involvement or how this uh, happened within the uh, city of Tuscaloosa. It's, it was home. It was home to the point that's where I went to elementary school, high school, and then I attended the University of Alabama also. And during the times in the late 70s and 80s, when there was not a whole lot of black students on the campus there, I, I had a chance to experience that, what life was like there at the University of Alabama. And I, and I share that. Uh, it's, uh, it's still home. And I want to go back. I want to franchise Sights and Sound Museum and the first franchise I like to do in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. But I do know that if I franchise Sights and Sounds Museum, I got to have money. Because if I don't have money to do it, then it will not be done like it is now. Uh, people will donate money, but they want to change the curriculum that I have <laughs> here in Sights and Sounds Museum. So 
that's 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 what Tuscaloosa is all about. I, I my my childhood I thought when I was growing up was not all that good. Now as an adult, I thank the God Almighty every day for I, for me having that experience as a child because that's what helped me to do what I'm doing today and I can pass that on to young people. All right, Mr. Horton, so we're here in front of the uh, display about Africa. There seems to be a lot of interesting history here. Could you maybe tell us some history about early Africa prior to slavery? Well, my introduction to Africa when I was a young man, if I can say that, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, was through someone by the name of Tarzan who was swinging through trees and his monkey, Jane, I mean, Cheater, excuse me, Jane, and his uh, mate, uh, Jane. And I actually thought that Tarzan, Cheetah, and Jane ruled Africa because that's what I saw. Every time he yelled, the animals would run and the people would run. I was I totally surprised? And the thing that really got me so interested in Africa because everything I, else I saw was negative about Africa, the way people dressed, the food they ate. There wasn't anybody there who seemed like they had any common sense, they seem like they're always fighting among themselves, was I saw a map that showed Africa and it portrayed Africa and showed how you could superimpose America, China, and some other countries in that steel. And then I found these pictures of these beautiful cities that was in Africa. And Budweiser put out a collection called The Great Kings and Queens of Africa. And every one of those people was black. And I said, oh, okay, so who is telling the truth and not telling the truth? And as I continued to research, I found out some, some things that just wasn't common and that was not told to me as I was a child growing up. But I always remember, once again, back to my great-grandmother who said that to me, but I never saw it anywhere in writing or in the pictures or anything about it. I, I was kind of confused because when I would read the Bible, it would say one thing, but show something else. And particularly when he gave you the description of what Jesus looked like in the Bible. But every house I went into from my grandmothers to my mothers and other people, they always portrayed him as being a Caucasian. But in the book, he said he had wool-like hair and his skin was brown. I said, okay. So all of a sudden, all I wanted to do was read. You know, because in that book, some... We didn't put that in the book, right? And it was just grown into what's now here in the Sights and Sound Museum. I tried to go out and research and find material that is the truth, but it's not being circulated. Now I know why when I was a young man growing up, it said if you wanted black people not to know something, where do you put the information? In the book. And then when I was in China in 1977, uh, uh, the Chinese mentioned that uh, to me. And I experienced it when a little Chinese little girl was walking behind me and she was trying to read my uh, messages on the back of my jacket and she said, fast breakers. And she said that about three times. And I turned around to her and I said, fast breakers, junior dribblers. And she said, sir, you speak English very well. So I then turned to the tour guide. I said, what's this fascination in your country about learning to speak the English language? And she said, how can you defeat your enemy if you don't know what they're saying? And she went, you know, too late. You already told me. So I now know and I remember that. So when I got back to America, once again, I started trying to find out the other side of the story about Africa as it relates to black people in America. The most surprising thing that happened to me is that I'm doing some research because I had this, I always wonder about the term they use, Native America Indians. And these people was dark skinned. Where did they come from? No one would tell you that they came directly from Africa, not as slaves, okay? And then I found out in the 1600s that a boat came from the islands down in Jamaica and those areas in the Bahamas loaded with 
black men and women, boys and girls. And the name of that boat was the Good Ship Jesus. And I got, okay, now I know. Now I understand what's going on, okay? So what are you going to do? Once again, you're going to continue to research, you're going to continue to find this information, and you're going to continue to share this information, okay? And if someone says to you, where you get this information from, I got it from you. You published this. I didn't publish this. So if it's lie, then you're the one that's telling a lie. You can't say that I'm telling a lie because I hadn't written a book. <laughs> I've written two, but I have not even published them yet about what was going on. That's why you see when you come to the museum, you see these pictures of great black queens and kings. You see a lot of artifacts from the first piano, the Colombo there, and you know, share some of the rituals that was uh, done back during that particular time. Most definitely. Now, you mentioned uh, rituals in Africa. You have an interesting artifact over here, this uh, interesting chicken. Could you give us a little bit of info about the rituals that actually come with that particular artifact? Uh, you got me on that one because I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. And, and uh, I think the creator, a gentleman came in two days ago. And he was in a wheelchair and we began to talk. And he told me he was from Africa. I said, okay. I said, then you might be able to help me. How long you been here in the country? He said, I've only been here for several months now. And I was reading about trying to find certain places to go see. And I saw online about the Sights and Sounds Museum. That's why I'm here. I said, someone just donated this piece to the museum, this chicken. And he looked at me and he smiled. I said, I was told that was tribes in Africa at one particular time that when a young man was of age that he was able to marry, that they would summon all the females the same age and they would put their names on a piece of paper. They would put it inside this chicken here and they would light it. And once it burned for a while, they would dump it out. They would search through the ashes and if they could find one, with the young lady's name on it, that was who he was married. He just started laughing and smiled. I said, is that true? He said, mm-hmm. I said, is it really true? He said, mm-hmm, and I'll get you some information. <laughs> so uh, I was gonna paint it, and I was told, no, it's original. You know, that's actually one of the ones that was used by one of the tribes back during that particular time. Now, earlier we talked a little bit about slavery, and when it comes to slavery, I know most people are familiar with the Underground Railroad, and most people tend to associate Harriet Tubman with the Underground Railroad, but you have a little bit of a different history. Could you share what you know about the Underground Railroad that most people um, don't have a perspective on yet? Well, there were some interesting things when I started looking at the Underground Railroad, and I was very interested in Harriet Tubman because when I was in elementary school, high school, even in, in college. Uh, you always heard about Harry Tubman and the Underground Railroad, but you and the, the word, you may hear about the Quakers. Harry Tubman, the Quakers and the Underground Railroad. You didn't hear about William Steele, who is now known as the father of the Underground Railroad, who kind of came up with the whole idea and the concept of, of that. But the most interesting thing about Harry Tubman, when I found out that her birth name was not Harry Tubman, it was Armenti Ross. And I go like, why did she change her name? Very simple. That's what they was looking for. They was looking for <laughs> Armenti Ross. And she was smart enough to say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my name to Harry Tubman. The other interesting thing about her that I found out, and uh, some people have given me, well, why well, you don't have to tell that part of it, but ever I say, well, you know, during the time that she was getting people to leave the South and go North, the first time she left, her husband would not leave with her. When she came back to get him, oh, to her surprise, he had married another woman, so he still would not go back with her during that particular time. Uh, she was very interesting, and they say she never lost uh, a passenger, and I was question about that. I said, why did she never lose a passenger? And then I found this book where it showed her standing there with a 45 with a gun in her hand. And people were saying, well, why did she have the gun in her hand? They said, well, she had to have some way of protecting them. I said, no, she wasn't worried about that. She wasn't worried about being caught. She was worried about someone going back, telling the master and the people the route of the Underground Railroad. So I was told that she would say, okay, now if you decide that you want to go back, 
you may go back, but you won't go back alive. I'm going to take care of you right here. I said, now that's a smart, <laughs> that's a smart uh, uh, lady. I had an opportunity to meet her great, great grandniece. She's been visiting Sights and Sounds for several uh, years now, and we'll be planning to come to Sights and Sounds again soon. She and her older sister, she's 86 and her sister is 92. So we're looking forward to that visit. But one of the other most interesting pieces I found out when I was working on the Underground Railroad is the lawn jockey. Now, I grew up when every time I saw that little black lawn jockey on somebody's lawn, I thought that was the worst thing in the world. And I thought that the Caucasian people would send a message to me that they didn't want to be bothered with black people. Uh, I'm doing some research and I found out Jamie, the lawn jockey, what he was called, play one of the most important roles during the Underground Railroad. If you saw him standing in front of a house or outside of a plantation with the light on at night, you knew that was a safe place to go. It's a safe haven houses. And I always wondered, I always saw the lantern, you know, earlier in the window, but he played a very uh, important part. If you want to hear the rest of the story of how he got there, come to the Sights and Sounds Museum and we we'll share. It's a little long. We'll share, we'll share it with you. The other thing that was uh, fascinating to me is before we became the United States, there was the colonists or the other organized uh, territories, and each one of them had their own money. And on that money, they portray black individuals as slaves. So the question, once again, is you kept asking me, well, why did they put black people on their money? I said, because we were their money. Think about it. He was working now. And I have that uh, Confederacy money, whatever, uh, here at the museum. People could come through and see it. The most controversy uh, bit I get in Sights and Sounds Museum is about John Hanson. John Hanson was president of the Continental Congress. That's before we became the United States. Uh, he's been portrayed as some people as a black person. Some say no. Uh, on the back of the $2 bill, I saw this little shadow that they told me uh, where this seemed like a black man sitting there. And I was told that's a shadow. I said, well, I didn't have no cameras back there during that particular time. So how could that be a shadow? So you mean to tell me that the person who are painting the picture, he just picked one person out of all those men <laughs> sitting there and made him darker than anyone else. It'll tell you when you look, at, look him up that he was a Moor. All Moors that I know of, they was dark-skinned people. But that is a controversy. I took it down. At one particular time, I took the whole exhibit area down. But more I read, the more my, I don't know if I can use the term, my gut feeling said, don't do that. It is what, once again, you know, uh, there's a reason behind the two dollar bill. What? It's in circulation, but you got to go to the bank and ask for the two dollar bill. Why it's not floating around like all the rest of the money? Because if it was, it was same thing would probably happen uh, all over America and all over the world. Who is that black man sitting back on the back of the two dollar bill? And you got to tell him <laughs> who, that, who that person is. That's one of the pieces there. The other one during that particular time is John Brown. I was in college before I realized and got the understanding that John Brown was a Caucasian. You know, and they killed him because he and his family did the raid on, uh, when, on Harper Ferry and said to the community, it's time for us to stop doing this to, to black people, you know. They should have their freedom and they shouldn't have to be treated the way that they're being treated. These are some of the things that we saw this share. The first black man who was a part of a Congress, you know, most people think it just happened in the uh, 50s and the 60s and whatever. Oh, no. Back in 1800, we had black men who was a part of a Congress and making the decision about what's happening here in America. Yeah, that, that is some controversial information. Now, speaking of controversy, you have this uh, post over here that says, know your six black presidents. Could you tell us a little bit of the uh, history behind that particular message? Where is that post to now? <laughs> <laughs> that one is one that has really had lots of people coming in here in the museum. Uh, I heard for years that there was 
black men who was president. And then someone said to me, I said, how could he be, how could he, black men has been president and no one know it because of the skin color? And they said, well, in America, they say, if you just got one thirty second ounce of Caucasian or black blood in you, then you're black. Well, what some historians have done, has done some research now with this new technique that we have, and what they have said that these five men, other than President Barack Obama, are black because they were able to trace their either their mothers or their grandmothers or their fathers uh, was black, and the, the the wife, you know, she was married to a black man or the black uh, Caucasian man was married to a white woman or had a child by her, and the plantations was filled with black men and women. By the fact, there were more black men and women on the plantation than there was Caucasian. So it could be very obvious that that's there. I didn't come up with the idea of the concept. I waited until it was got in print by other historians, and then I just shared the information. All right, Ms. Horton, I want to get into some of the interesting uh, history about some of the prominent individuals throughout history. Could you tell us a little bit about Stagecoach Mary? Uh, <laughs> she was, I was told, 6'1". She hung out at the bar with the men. She also was a mail carrier on the stage court, so you know she had to be tough. They tell me that she didn't play. And when I found out about her, I said, okay, now I understand that uh, I was growing up and you would see the cowboy pictures or you see the westerns. You didn't see black people doing any of those kinds of things uh, at all. But uh, come to Sites and Sounds Museum, we'll give you a little bit more history on the Stagecoach Mayor. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned um, cowboys and westerners. Can you tell us a little bit of history about what we know as the Lone Ranger? I was <clears throat> so upset. Because I, I once again, growing up watching The Long Ranger, I could not understand how he was able to communicate and be with the Native American Indians the way that he were. You know, the, you know Tonto, and anytime they needed some safe place, and they're hiding from somewhere, you know, and food and whatever, where did they show up? They showed up there. Found out that The Long Ranger was really Bass Reed, and Bass Reed was a slave, and he became a U.S. Marshal. And he captured hundreds. Matter of fact, he even arrested his brother for something that he did wrong. Oh, so he was a he was he, he was a legend back during that particular time. And I was very excited to find that. Uh, after that, I started wearing my cowboy hat and my cowboy boots and jeans all the time. You know, it was okay to be a, a cowboy. <laughs> Love that. Now, the other interesting individual who a lot of people are familiar with is uh, Miss uh, Madam C. J. Walker. Uh, most people know her for um, her invention or what she had to do with the hot comb, but you also have another perspective on um, her life. Could you share a little bit about Madam C.J. Walker as well? She was very interesting. She uh, went to cosmetology school, and that's where she got a skill from. She also was very instrumental in starting her own business and sharing it. The, the word is out that she was the first self-made black female millionaire here in America. Uh, she did the improvement to the hot comb. Many people think that she created the hot comb. She did not, but she improved the hot comb and the straightening of the hair and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was very impressed when I saw her riding around her Rolls Royce uh, back in the day and one too many <laughs> uh, individuals could do the things that she did. Very well dressed. Uh, a lot of the young ladies who come through today, when I bring them over, I say, I want you to see how people were dressing back in the day, I'll call it, okay, versus how you're dressing to, today. You know, if you, you was a young man, you just didn't see it all, you nope, know, because it was covered. Uh, today, I don't know what's going on, but let me leave that one alone before I get in serious trouble. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mr. Horton, I want to kind of fast forward up to the civil rights era. 
Uh, many people kind of, even though the civil rights era was a thing amongst black people as a whole, I know a lot of people tend to sort of make Dr. King sort of the face of the civil rights era. Now, you have a very interesting story in relation to Dr. King. Would you mind sharing that with us? <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, at, at my age and growing up back during that particular time, there was a lot of things that I experienced in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, when people think about the civil rights movement during that particular time. And what went on in Tuscaloosa, you know, we're very, very actively involved in it. And I did. I had a meeting with uh, Dr. King. When I got through school that morning, my homeroom teacher said, that Dr. Uh, Hughes wants you in his office now, who was the principal at our high school. And as I stood up to walk out the door, I thought about it. I said, I'm not going to the office. I, but I hadn't done anything wrong. I went to sit back in my chair and she said, get out of here. I don't know where you're going, but he knows that you're here. Go to the office. When I get to the office, I uh, walked inside and the secretary said, they are waiting for you. And I'm going, they are waiting for me? I turned to walk out the door and she said, go ahead. You don't want me to call your mother. You know what happened. I turned around. <laughs> <laughs> and knocked on his door and walked in. His, his desk was facing the door, and there was three men, and there was four chairs in front of him. And those three of those chairs was three men. I had no idea who they were. So when I walked in, he said to me, to have a seat, and he said, and Dr. King would like to talk to you and ask you to do something. I'm going like, Dr. King want me to do something? What do you want me to do? And he did not say anything, but he introduced himself. And when he stood up, I was totally shocked and surprised because I was expecting to look up at this big, tall gentleman, and I'm standing there looking down on him. <laughs> and we shook hands, and we sat. He didn't say anything. Jose Williams uh, spoke, and he said that what we would like for you to do this afternoon when Dr. King speak to sit on the stage with us. When he finished his speak, we'd like for you to walk to the state, to the podium, the mic, and tell all of the teachers and all of students here to join you and I and Dr. King and Reverend Rogers, and we're gonna march on downtown Tuscaloosa. And I, I'm standing there and I look over at my principal, he's shaking his head because he know already <laughs> that I'm not gonna do that. And I walked over to Dr. King and I said to him, sir, I admire you and what you're doing, but you teach us something that I just can't be a part of. You teach people that if someone slap you, you turn the other cheek and let them slap that one too. If they knock you down and you rolling on the ground and they're kicking you, you just lie there and cover up and let them do that. No, I am not gonna do that. And I just turned and walk away and just sit back in my seat. And as I got there, I turned and I said, and why are you asking me to do it? Well, at that time, Jose Williams said, aren't you president of the senior class? I said, yes, sir. He said, aren't you captain of the football team? I said, yes, sir. He said, until I'm surprised, you're also president of the Student Government Association. I said, yes, sir, so what does that have to do with it? He said, young man, if you walked out the door now and climbed up on top of the building and just jumped off, the other students saw you doing that, they would not ask why you were doing it. They would just follow you and do it. You are a leader. I said, no, sir, I am no leader. See, because they hang, kill, and murder leaders. I, I am not ready to die. And I sit down in my seat. Well, they didn't have the march. And they say that they didn't have the march because uh, they, I don't know, I can't say what they thought, whatever, but I was told that after I wouldn't endorse the march, they knew that the other students probably wouldn't do it either. They didn't want to know where was I, you know, during that time. That was my uh, uh, meeting with him. Um, I admire Dr. King in this effort. And what I tried to do here at the museum is show, show the strength that he had and the courage that he had. But I also like for people to understand that what the media had about his relationship with other individuals and other people and, and, and sharing their thoughts. You know, you see I have a picture with him with uh, uh, Muhammad, also a picture with him with uh, uh, just other individuals 
other than people that was just uh, involved in the uh, in the civil rights civil rights movement. Most definitely. Now, also here, you also have a replica of a particular bridge. Could you give us the history of that uh, of that particular replica? Well, that, that's that that's that's interesting. And once again, with the Selma Bridge in 65, I happen to be one of the people that was on that bridge. But it, it goes back to other things that point my environment during the civil rights movement until 1964. And in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, there's a news article in the exhibit that says the hell hole of Tuscaloosa. And in that article, my mother walked up to me and she said, uh, were you at this meeting? And I didn't say anything. She turned to the, the next page and she said, now, before you answer me, tell me who this is sitting in this meeting. <laughs> and she pointed to my pictures sitting there, okay? The next year, she gave me a hard time about that. I visited my uncle and aunt who lived in Selma, Alabama. And it was that Sunday afternoon, I and a young man were sitting on their porch and we was talking. Three young ladies came walking past. And as they got to where we were, one of them came up on the porch and she said to me, we're going to march downtown to help our parents get the right to vote. Would you march with us? And I said, no, I can't do that. My mother told me not to get involved in that. She goes down and talks to the other two young ladies, and she and another young lady walked back up on the porch. And when she got there, they both held out their hands and said, if you march with us, we will let you hold our hands. Now, you know what happened. Before they got back down on the street, I'm standing down with both of my eyes out saying, we shall overcome. <laughs> he took the other young lady's hand, I took the two young ladies' hand, and we caught up with the march. And we was not too far on the bridge before all of a sudden there were all kinds of noise and people was yelling and hollering and falling. Those big horses running toward us. And I was standing there and I remember the young lady saying to me, she said, does it hurt? And I'm wondering what she talking about, does it hurt? Then all of a sudden the blood from a scar that I have in my head now started running down my face. What I got hit with, I have no idea. But yes, I was in tears. And uh, I said, no, it doesn't hurt. But I know my mother is going to kill me. <laughs> because she told me not to get involved in those kinds of things. So uh, that's, that's some of the things that I, I wrote about in my book. That's entitled Little Jimmy to Mr. Horton. When I was growing up, everybody called me Little Jimmy. The other interesting thing about the Dr. King exhibit, a lot of people don't know, a lot of people don't know that that was not his birth name. He was not born Martin Luther King. He actually was born Michael King. When his father decided to become a minister, he changed his name because he wanted people to think of him religiously. And Dr. King at that time was only seven years old, so he also changed his name because he was a junior. Now, Mr. Horton, I want to talk about uh, some of the organizations that people may or may not be familiar with. Uh, one that some people do know a little bit about is the Buffalo Soldiers. Do you have any interesting information that you can maybe share on the uh, Buffalo Soldiers? Well, first of all, uh, I was always curious to know why they called them the Buffalo Soldiers. I thought that was some negative. And when I did the research, I found out that they actually were given a nickname by the Cheyenne Warriors back during that particular time. They said when they saw them, how courageous they were, and their fighting, and also the color of their skin, and their hair reminded them of the buffalo because they fought against the buffalo for food and shelter and all kinds of things. That was it. The other thing I found out in 1800, over 180,000 black men served as part of the buffalo soldiers. Okay? Now, that's not including those uh, uh, black men from the South who also fought with the South because they was told whatever story they was told. That was just unbelievable. And they weren't, was not so much uh, there to fight against the Native American Indian, but they also was there to help America fight, and they fought in Cuba uh, and also in Mexico on behalf of the United States. That was very interesting to find that out. And the one that really shocked me, I found out there was a female Buffalo soldier. 
Now, that $13 a month was good money back during that particular time. So she did not let them know that she was a female, but she got sick and she had to go take a test. And when that happened, she decided, and now it's time for me to go, and she left. So the Buffalo Soldiers are very played a very important role in America being what it is today. Now, Mr. Horton, as you know, here in America, uh, America really couldn't have survived without all of the great inventions that were offered to it. Uh, what many people don't realize is that many of the inventions were actually invented by black people. As we're sitting here in front of your inventor's table, would you mind sharing some of the inventions that were invented by African Americans that many people would be surprised to know about? Yes. There have been many of them, but I, the one that I got so excited about was when I found out that as a young man growing up, my grandfather and my stepfather would tell me, boy, go get me the monkey's wrench. I always wondered why they call it the monkey wrench. I got started with the museum and I started looking up patents for things that was invented by African Americans or black people and I found out that Mr. Jack Johnson, the heavyweight boxer, uh, in 1922 invented a wrench. And that's why they call it the monkey wrench because of his, his invention, inventing uh, that particular uh, wrench. The other one that was very surprising to me was Dr. Charles Drew who created blood plasma. Now, he went to the hospital in the area that he went in, there was not a hospital where typical they admitted black people. While he was there, he needed a blood transfusion, and they said to him, because he was black, they didn't have any uh, medicine for him, and he died. The other one that was very exciting to me was the term the real McCoy. Because I grew up thinking there were some hillbillies up in the woods or somewhere, and they just nicknamed him the real McCoy, and they asked about that. but. Uh, Mr. McCoy invented the technique of how you could oil machines without stopping. Before him, you had to stop the train or any machine that you had on the factory uh, line there. You oil it and then you start it back up. That was costing a lot of money uh, in order to, to do that. Then the one that really surprised me also was a pencil sharpener. When I was in the school, that pencil sharpener that we put our pencil in was that. A typewriter. And it goes on and on and on with all the different uh, items that we uh, invented. I have several books that I acquired now that's part of the museum. You can come to the museum, you can sit, and you can look through them and find out some things for yourself. <laughs> 